All right. Welcome in, everybody, to our Terp Talk pregame uh, Maryland and Cornell preview. And I just looked at the inside of the cross site, and they had about 50 people select who they thought was going to win. And it was 46 to 4 Maryland. All right. I don't think that would be the odds, though. But uh, let's start off with our guest for the show, and that's Tony Wheeler. Tony, tell us what the Maryland Cornell game is going to look like. I think Cornell is going to do everything they can to try to get possession, keep possession, keep the ball away from Maryland. They're not a deep team at all. Um, you know, 63, 64% of their goal scoring comes from three players at attack. They have a very, very thin midfield. Um, that attack unit, 60% of their total scoring comes from those three players. They don't have an especially deep defense either. Their defensive midfield is pretty shallow. Uh, of their four top defensive middies, two of them are freshmen. One's a converted offensive midfielder. One's a graduate student. Uh, so I think what you're going to see is a game coming down to how much Luke Weirman can dominate the faceoff X. If he does, you got to figure in a 90 degree weather day that's forecasted for Memorial Day up here in Hartford. Maryland's going to have the ball too much, and they're going to wear down that Cornell defense. Um, that's pretty much what it looks like. Wayne, tell us about the loss of uh, – potentially the loss. We know Jack Horst isn't playing, and that's a fact. Pulled the hamstring again. I think Maryland could easily cover that end of it with Danny Maltz or Danny Kelly. Hi, I'm Maryland wide receiver Rakim Jarrett. If you've been hurt in a car crash, people will tell you you need a lawyer. My mom says you need my lawyer. The Jack Litch Law Group. At 855-BIG-DOG-1. Don't just get a lawyer. Get the, the lawyers. lawyers. If you're hurt, listen to my mom and bite back with the big dogs. On the second midfield, Wayne, Roman Puglisi is impossible to replace because he's all American. What was he, the sixth pick in the MLL draft? Uh, do you see Roman making a go of it tomorrow? Look, I think he will because he's Roman Puglisi, and if he can hold the stick, he's going to play. Now, the question is how much, and can he be re-injured? He hurt his uh, wrist or thumb area closing out on a shooter near the end of the first quarter in the game on Saturday night. Saw him on the sideline, wrapped up uh, with an ice bag around that area. But I think he's probably going to give it a go, and especially because there might be some other guys who might be limited due to other factors. I think you're going to see a go with Roman Puglisi. With Viner Fourgates, You've heard the phrase, we make your company work. What that means to us is that we take care of every ticket, every call, all the time. If you're tired of waiting on hold for tech support, or it takes too long for your tech support company to get back to you in an email, try Viner Forgates, where making your company work is our primary mission. I had a question for Tony. Uh, it would seem to me that Cornell's maybe their best player ends up playing for Maryland due to the Ivy League uh, eligibility rules. If Donville was still with Cornell, what position would he be playing? He'd be playing midfield for sure. That, and he'd be playing a very similar role that he kind of plays for Maryland with uh, really, really good off-ball movement. So Cornell, their leading goal scorer, a guy named John Piatelli, who actually just tied the all-time single-season goal-scoring record uh, in the history of Cornell, He's got 65 goals this year, not a Dodger, just an off ball guy, fine space. Uh, and the thought of having Donville paired with a guy like Piatelli in the crease, it would just be an absolute nightmare for any defense to have to play. Um, well, I've seen Cornell up close now. Uh, I feel like for three weeks, or this will be the third game. And we saw him at Ohio state, saw him on Saturday. We're going to see them again. To me, they look like a team that wants to play faster, that's using their little guys, using speed, trying to eat up space and make the defense make a decision, and, and then they go to score. What you just said is almost a reversal of that, where if they want to stay in this game, they're going to have to muck it up, slow it down, and play a style that, that I haven't seen them play. Have you seen them play the slower style? I haven't. Actually, I looked up their, their advanced uh, statistics. They're really middle of the pack in, in time to first shot. So they're not, they don't look to score in transition. They don't look to score in early offense. In terms of time of total possession, 
like how long they will possess a ball for on average per possession. They're in the back half of the NCAA. So their offense is really, really predicated on trying to get primarily two or three guys space to dodge and draw slides. They get Michael Long behind the goal, who's a real quick kind of scat back type of, of dodger. They got a big midfielder, a guy named Hugh Keller, who just kind of runs out of the box, uh, head down and just goes. He, big kid, runs people over. And they got those two smaller midfielders that, that are really, really kind of jitterbugs that kind of get out on the wings and try and get in space. Piatelli is always going to be in the middle. Uh, CJ Kirst is always going to be on the left wing. Um, but they don't look to score in transition a ton when you look at their defensive midfield and their long stick midfielders. They're not scoring a ton. They're long, they're close defensemen aren't bringing the ball uh, into the offensive zone much. Um, but it wouldn't surprise me to see them trying to move fast, kind of like that John Wooden kind of adage about, you know, move fast, but be deliberate. That might be more their offensive style, but they're not going to push in transition like Maryland or Rutgers might. Todd, I know you studied some of the numbers from uh, Rutgers. Uh, anything that you found interesting? I, I We talked about it last night about their lack of success at the X face-off X. Yeah, well, you know, Cornell has had some good face-off games in the, since they've entered the NCAA tournament, but overall, they're, again, they're, they're just about average. I think they were probably the lowest face-off percentage of the four teams left overall for the season, and they haven't faced Luke Weirman, obviously. Now, uh, and I, I, another question, though, that I have, because one of the, for Tony, uh, who's looked at the advanced stats, because one of the things that jumped out at me is Cornell's ability to prevent teams from clearing the ball. They're really, really good. Teams only clear it about 77 percent against them. Rutgers went in at 91 percent or so, the best in the country at clearing the ball. And they had five failed clears out of 20 attempts. So is Maryland going to face going to face that? And does Maryland really need to protect the ball in the middle of the field? It's, it's a great point. And, and Cornell on the advanced metric side of it have the third best ride back rate in the country in terms of forcing turnovers, getting the ball back and, and doing something with it. So third best in the country. Interestingly enough, they don't have a ride the way that we might be familiar with having watched, you know, UVA, um, you know, we're, we're really familiar with those like really hyper aggressive full field 10 man ride type games. Uh, Cornell doesn't employ a 10 man ride very often at all. Those three attackmen, though, are relentless when it comes to riding the ball back. And that's what they do. The, their midfielders will sit back a little more, kind of jam up the middle of the field. And those three attackmen just run crazy all over the field riding the ball back. And that's what mm -hmm. they do. And you saw that have an effect on Rutgers. He finally fumbled the ball away right in front of the goalie. And that was probably one of those moments where, well, this one's over. Once uh, on Saturday, when when that, that exact ride situation happened. And, twice, uh, right? It happened twice. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it led to two goals. I thought Rutgers was just deplorable. They were so bad. I, I can't think of anything they did well. Uh, their goalie curse did not have a good game. And that's another thing. The goalie has had some good games, but overall his percent, her, his percentages throughout the year were not strong. And, you know, they're playing well now, Cornell, but man, they threw up a few clunkers along the way, barely beating uh, Syracuse and uh, getting swamped by army who turned out to be uh, just another mediocre team by the time the season was over. Where are their weaknesses, Tony? Depth. Um, depth in the midfield. That That is their biggest glaring weakness. Uh, their goalie, Chase Ireland, you know, he's he's the, the younger brother of, of TD Ireland, you know, face-off, one of the best face-off people in the history of the sport. Big kid, plays a high arc, really, really good in the clearing game. But again, advanced statistics, opponent-adjusted statistics, 46, 47th best goalie in the country. Um so they're, they're not super deep in the midfield. Their defensive midfield is really, really shallow. They got six top scorers and, and really no depth, depth behind that. One really, really good long uh, close defenseman, a guy named Gavin Adler, just erases the top dodging threat from another team. I suspect Keegan Khan is going to get a, a dose of him. Their other two defensemen, kind of classic stay-at-home defensemen. They don't get out and about much, really solid. 
They try and pack in behind Dodgers. Uh, they try and stay connected. That's what the lacrosse coaches will say. They start, try and stay connected. They don't like to slide a lot. They're probably going to follow Princeton's strategy of not sliding much at all and trying to make Maryland beat their players one-on-one. If Maryland gets the ball more than, than Cornell gets it, the ball is going to be in the back of the net a lot. How about Louis Wisnowskis uh, only took five shots, Tony, in that game, scored all four of them. Uh, why was that? What were they doing to stop him from shooting or getting the ball? They changed their defensive matchups. First time Princeton played Maryland, uh, Princeton's best on-ball defender, a guy named George Bond, he covered Keegan Kahn and held him scoreless, held him to zero and zero. Uh, their second best on-ball defender, a guy named Ben Finley, uh, was on Molliver and held Molliver to an assist. Funny enough, held Molliver to a single assist last night. Uh, Pace Billings played Logan the first time through, and Logan had four goals to assist, something like that. They sent Billings up to the – they bumped him up to play against Anthony DeMeo, who's just been on a tear, and they put George Bond on, on Logan Wisnowskis. So they, you know, Logan didn't get the ball a lot. Um, but what it did was it freed up Keegan Khan to go right. for three goals and two assists. It's funny, how about, how about the possibility of uh, anybody – this is to open to everybody of uh, John Donville, maybe filling in also a little on the back end on defense, given, given the possibility that Maryland might be a little shorthanded back there. I, I, I think know Bruce, I know Bruce and, and, and Wayne saw the same thing I did. When you put Kyle long in the fourth quarter on, on a face-off wing, if Maryland loses those face-offs, Long's not going to come off. He's going to stay and play defense as well. And Donville with his, you know, box background, he's not a stranger to playing defense. Uh, he'll, he will also, he was involved in that real controversial play that led to that three minute unreleasable penalty. Donville was on, on ball defense against Bo Peterson. Um, and Peterson crashed the cage and Geppert came across and hit him and drew that penalty. So, you know, Donville is not a stranger to playing defense. I could see him taking some defensive runs. Well, I look at the set stat sheet from Princeton, and maybe one of the trends Maryland's had recently is the amount of turnovers. Uh, 19 turnovers in a championship game will lead to an upset. Some of their plays that they made against Princeton were downright stupid. I mean, they really were. Uh, we, we talked about Weirman taking a shot when you're trying to kill a three-minute penalty. Uh, we saw Bubba throw one away. It was like absurd. I saw balls thrown away that I haven't seen all year. Now, I don't know if they were confused or, uh, you know, obviously uh, the day was kind of weird because they had to wait so long and uh, to, before they started. But uh, I just, they can't get away with 19 turnovers. That's my opinion. That's got to be cut down maybe to the, a dozen or whatever. Uh, in the same regard, Cornell is not going to get away with uh, the Terps winning two thirds of the faceoffs. They're not going to get away with it, no matter no matter who's playing and who's not playing with Roman. But uh, to, for my money, you know, I would like to see Donville play short shorty, and I'll tell you why. If you analyze how much time that Roman spends on the offensive end of the field. It's probably not that much less the amount of time that Donville does. In other words, uh, as your first mini. And yeah, I'm, I'm not sure about that. But yes, Roman does cross over and play for Roman plays 15, a lot. 20 way. seconds. Yeah, but he's only out there for 20 seconds. And that's where Maryland's the Maryland's greatest advantage to me schematically has been keeping somebody on like Roman for 20 seconds and running him off and creating a fast break in the middle of a possession. They are just artful at that. Well, they so, played yes. the substitution game better than anybody I've ever seen. Anybody. All yeah. right. However, however, if Donville's already in the game and Donville's down there, you know, you trap the other team. With right. their with their attackmen having to play mm -hmm. Donville, and that's suicide for them. So uh, for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction, and putting Long and Donville in that position could hurt you on defense. Although I'm not sure with Donville, but on the other hand, it's going to help you on offense because as good as Roman has been on offense, 
he doesn't come close to the quality of play of Kyle Long or Donville. Tony? You can hang it. Yeah. No, go ahead, Bruce. No. Or go ahead, Wayne. Go ahead, Wayne. You see right. any truth to that statement? I, I, I mean, it's absolutely the case. I mean, if you're talking about just offensive skill, um, you know, I'm, I'm not super worried about a guy like Donville or a guy like Kyle Long playing man-to-man defense. Where you saw in the UVA game, Kyle Long got trapped back on defense. It was off ball where, where those things break down. You know, it's, it's someone cutting to the goal or someone missing the slide. One of the more, I think, underappreciated things about this entire Maryland team, we focus so much on the offense, rightly so. You know, it's beautiful offense, an offense like we, we've never seen in a college game. Maryland's defense, if you watch the way that defense moves together, slides, recovers, communicates, it's as beautiful as the offense. Right now, wholeheartedly. Yeah. And right now, when you look at the advanced, the advanced metrics, right now, Maryland has the top opponent adjusted offense, defense, and face-off units, and the fifth best opponent adjusted goaltending play. Logan McNaney is up to what 58% save percentage now in the country. He has been unbelievable the last 10 games. And close to 70% in the tournament. I think on the ESPN broadcast, they mentioned Luke Weirman is the person who, player who advanced the most between this last season and this season. I think within the season, you can look at Logan McNaney as saying that guy made the biggest jump from game one to what's going to be game 18. And he's become a shutdown superstar. I saw a couple people from Tampa who are in to see the game today where uh, the Tampa Spartans are playing for their division championship in the NCAAs. And the first thing they brought up was Logan McNaney. Out of all the players on Maryland, they said, what do you think of your goalie? Because he's making that big of an impression on TV. Uh, it's just spectacular. Yeah, 19 saves, 19 saves uh, on, on Saturday. But I, I have to say that I think, Tony, your, your point earlier of, about the beauty of Maryland's defense, I think Maryland's defense makes some of Logan's saves easier for, a, you know, a high level goalie. I'm not saying that, that, that I could make those saves, but for a high level goalie, you know, Mar- Maryland forces teams into tough shots that are a lot easier to see and a lot easier for, for the goalie to save. And Wayne uh, Mason could probably talk to that a lot. And, and he does. That was one of the few games where I stood on the sideline with Mason for the entire game. So standing there with a the goalie talking about how easily he's right now, Logan's going from a low shot, almost baiting you to take one at eye level. And then you do, and he picks that off that he got, he might've gotten into Princeton's head. There were a couple of times if I was Princeton, I would hit the gas pedal. And Princeton goes down, sort of pokes around timidly, turns around and throws the ball back to midfield. Like, well, if you're going to win that game, you have to go in and score when you have the opportunity because you can't make, to Tony's point, you can't make Maryland show up in the wrong position. You can run your offense for 80 seconds and you can't get the, even if you get the matchup you want, it's still no good. And you saw that within the game. The only time Princeton looked like they had a shot is when they were on the move. They came out of the right alley, snapped a couple at ear level past Logan, and then a couple on a a penalty or an an odd situation. But in their regular offense, they were completely ineffective. So I will say if Tony's got this right, that Cornell wants to slow this down and run 79 seconds off the clock, that's probably going to make Logan look fantastic and lead to some really weak shots by the Cornell offense. Last point, uh, Tony, Carcaterra talked, talked a lot about it on TV. I know uh, me and Todd heard it, but you guys probably didn't. That Cornell was clogging up the middle and forcing Rutgers to make shots from the outside, which apparently are the only kind of balls the goalie can save. And other words, the goalie's not strong enough for, you know, the impossible save. Uh, explain that. and. Doesn't Maryland's passing, the rapid passing, kind of get around that problem? It does. So I, I mentioned earlier Gavin Adler. He's the only defenseman on that team, on that entire defensive unit, not just their, their close defense, that actually will get out and about. He'll go out and pressure the ball carriers. He has almost 40 cause turnovers this season. 
Uh, and he's a ground ball machine. He has like almost 70 ground balls. Everyone else, though, packs in way behind that. And the last thing you want to do, the reason why Princeton's uh, scheme was so effective last, relatively effective, right? I mean, Maryland still wins by five goals, but here we are, you know, Maryland going to the final four with a fairly comfortable win, but we're looking at it as like, wow, Princeton really jammed them up. The way you short circuit the passing is you, you kind of shut off the adjacent passes, right? And in, in the post-game press conference, uh, Princeton's coach, Matt Madelon talked about that, that they, they were changing who the outlet pass was and they were forcing Maryland to try to beat defenders one-on-one to go to the goal. That's how you defeat the, that Maryland's passing. If Cornell wants to sit back and pack in behind an on-ball defender, Maryland shooters, Anthony DeMeo is going to be, is going to score five goals. You know, Logan Wisnowskis is going to score five goals. John Donville is going to score five goals. Owen Murphy, you know, who I think the Ukraine ought to bring in and, and give him some lessons on, on firing rockets. The guy mm-hmm. shoots so hard. Let, let Owen Murphy shoot 15 yards out against a defense that sagged in. Uh, Chase Ireland's going to spend the entire game, you know, turning and raking. Uh, so I, I think, I think Cornell's going to have to try to do something different. If they just try and jam the middle up, they're going to give up shots to Maryland shooters. The Maryland shooters are going to can we've seen on the year 40 to 50% of the time. Yeah. The um, way they move the ball and uh, you look, you can't stop everybody. You can stop Keegan Khan and you can slow down Malibur, but Holy cow. We got six guys coming at you. And if you don't have six strong defensemen out there, it's not going to work. Whether it's Kyle Long or Anthony DeMeo or Johnny Donville or uh, Murphy or, or Logan Murphy. We even mentioned Murphy. If he, he gets an inch, uh, look, we all think Maryland's going to win, so I'm not going to ask for predictions or anything like well, that. Before we go to close, just yes. got to give a shout out to Bubba, who from the time he intercepted that pass and he ran the 70 yards or so and scored, that that was to me a career capping moment for somebody who you know, gave up on being for the good of the team, gave up on being a uh, short stick. I think he was the number one recruit, Bruce, when when you and I interviewed him uh, at the Under Armour All American game. And to see him pick that off and go the distance, uh, it just was a great moment for Maryland yeah, across the That's Fairman. because they didn't want to slide to him because they afraid Murphy would kill him. But I'm going to tell you what Bubba did by doing that, okay, for what it's worth. Because I think the championship supersedes anything that happens professionally. But that being said, I think Bubba turned himself into a professional PLL player by going to be a short stick midi because the field is about 30 feet shorter and the shot clock is only 52 seconds. And guess what? That short stick midi, he's got to play offense sometimes. There's no doubt about it. And uh, that's the success of a Jake Bernhardt in the PLL and uh, with Drew Snyder and all these short stick middies from Maryland who've become stars in the PLL because they can play both ways. And, John Donville is Canadian, and John Donville is built to play both ways. Reminds me of uh, Brian, uh, what was his last name? Number 45. Uh, um, why am I blanking on Brian Cole. Cole. Brian Cole. Brian, one of the greatest Terps ever. He was so yeah. great. But there was a guy who said, yeah, okay, I'm going to play short stick midi. You know what I mean? I mean, he, you know, he just did it when he wanted to, you know, and, Canadians have that edge because that's how they grow up playing. So uh, it's going to be interesting. Okay. And uh, once again, you know, Terps played first, playing last. I- I'm tired of even talking about that crap. You know what I mean? But uh, it's a factor. And I don't think that any team playing in this kind of heat is really going to, they're going to have to use their bench. They're going to have to use their bench. And I've been saying it for a while now that a guy who could come in to be a factor in this game is the freshest guy on the Maryland team. He wears number 45, and his name is Wayne. Uh, man, I think his last name's Kelly. Bruce right. It's Daniel Kelly. It reminds me a little bit of when Colin, whatever his last name was, for Virginia, was suspended for the first game in 2010. 
only fresh legs on the field and scored five goals. Uh, Colin Brigg, I think. And one more thing, I told, told Wayne about this before. Uh, I was at a uh, FCA meeting when John Harbaugh spoke. And he talked about, he's a very religious guy. He talked about that, uh, now I'm not getting courting on you guys, but he talked about how God has a plan for everything. All right. And the plan for the Ravens was to the year before to go into New England and upset them on the road. And Lord knows we dropped the touchdown pass. Evans dropped the touchdown pass. And then uh, the field goal kicker, whose name I want to forget, all right, missed a 28 yard field goal or 32 yard field goal. And the Ravens lost New England went to the Super Bowl. One year, same day. Later, the Ravens went back, all right, and Ray Lewis had been given inspiring speeches about how, you know, there's people worse off, have worse problems than this, and we know that's happening right now. But one year to the day, the Ravens went back, and the message was fulfilled when they beat the Patriots to get to the, to get to the Super Bowl, and they beat them bad. Maryland's been there before. They've been in this situation. If it's going to be a close game, Maryland can't back away from it. They know what they they have to do. That's the main reason I like Maryland in this game a lot, because they've been there before. They've been in this circumstance. And uh, if there's any adversity with Chorus being out or Roman police or whoever, you know, I think they'll get over it because great teams, great teams get over setbacks. All right. And yeah, losing Roman Puglis is big. But first of all, we don't know if he's not playing. You know, if this was the NFL, you would think they're lying about everything. And I'm not so sure, you know, college basketball or, or lacrosse is any different. They don't tell the truth, Wayne. You know, we really don't know what's going on. And we won't well, know. Yeah. We won't know until they hockey. take the court. Yeah. At least it's not hockey where the guy broke his wrist. They say it's a lower, lower body injury. <laughs> um, but yeah final you know, word I'll give everybody a final 30 seconds Wayne you go first Terps still the best team I've ever seen best team I've ever covered certainly the best lacrosse team I've ever seen I haven't been in as long as Bruce but this has been a pleasure to watch and this will be our last pregame show of the season last one of these guys it has been fantastic Todd well, I'll go with Wayne and say that this is certainly the best Maryland lacrosse team I've ever seen as well over the years. And uh, it has been a pleasure to watch them and to talk with you all about it. And uh, hope, hoping, 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 and I'm on a plane to Hartford Monday morning, and I'm hoping that uh, we'll see them lift the trophy because it puts a terrible blemish on, on a otherwise phenomenal season if they fall one game short again. No, I agree, Tony. I think all of us have watched the Terps play this year and have known every single game that we were witnessing greatness. And I don't think we should, you know, diminish the greatness we've seen. The program has a moniker that says, be the best. I think come Memorial day at about three o'clock, the Terps are going to enter their name into that conversation as being the best that has ever played the sport of college lacrosse. And I think they're going to carry it home. And I'm not talking about the rat poison now, but I will not be a quiet guy if this turns out to be true. All right. That'll do it, everybody. Thanks for coming on. And uh, here we go. We'll be on the post game afterwards. It's going to be, it's going to be special, hopefully. And uh, I got great feeling about this game, no matter what's going on. So thank you all for coming on. I really appreciate it. And you can check this if you hear about it or whatever. We'll have it up on Turp Talk. And I'm Wayne, we'll make a decision whether or not we want to put this on fan slacks or not. Oh, I, I'm oh, not. Put it out there, Bruce. Uh, the worst thing can happen is somebody sees it. <laughs> All right, guys. Thanks a lot.